Magandang araw po. Annyeonghaseyo. Welcome to the UPKRC Global Korean Studies Roundtable today. I am Gyeongmin Bae from the UPKRC and I will be your moderator for today's event. Welcome everyone who joins UPKRC this afternoon. Um, first of all, let me briefly introduce UPKRC to all our audience. Um, on April 27, 2016, the University of the Philippines launched the Korea Research Center with the support of the Academy of Korean Studies, Korean Studies Promotion Service, aiming to provide Filipino scholars and researchers with opportunities to widen their interest in Korean studies. The center hopes to be a venue for students and professionals to produce meaningful comparative research and to promote collaborative partnerships among Korean and Philippine institutions. The center serves as a university-wide hub that helps promote and develop Korean studies in the university and beyond. It sponsors interdisciplinary and intercollege research and educational activities on Korean studies, as well as facilitates the training of the next generation of Koreanists in the country. So today's event is uh, one of the UPKRC's regular activities, but somewhat special. Uh, this year, UPKRC is conducting a core research project under the overarching theme, A Decade of Korean Studies in the Philippines, A Glance at the Past, A Gaze at the Present, and A Glimpse of the Future to assess Korean studies development in the Philippines. So uh, to talk about the Philippines, uh, it will be very meaningful uh, to meet all the international uh, speakers uh, from outside the Philippines. So as part of this project, uh, UPKRC is launching 2023 UPKRC Global Korean Studies Roundtable. And today we are joined by invited panels from the UK, Australia, and Thailand who will share information on how Korean studies in their respectful country has advanced and what challenges and opportunities they observed, and then how academic partnerships can be forged across regions and institutions. So I uh, hope everyone can have a fruit fruitful afternoon and we can learn something new from each other. Um, before we introduce uh, panels to you, uh, I will also read a uh, short house rules. Um, we would like to remind our viewers of some house rules. You may send your questions and comments uh, to our speakers throughout the event in the comment section of the Facebook and YouTube live streaming. The questions and comments will then be read uh, during the open forum and will be addressed by our guest speakers. And we are also reminded that uh, the whole forum is a safe space and thus will not tolerate any form of bullying and trolling academic or otherwise. So the organizer reserves the right to remove those who will create any disruption in any part of the program. We'd like to inform that uh, this event will be recorded and uploaded to the official uh, UPKRC Facebook and UPKRC uh, YouTube channel. Um, so now uh, let me introduce uh, our speakers. Uh, we have uh, three panels today. So uh, before we have a short presentation by each panel, I will first uh, read their bio note uh, all together. So our first uh, panel today is Dr. Jaehoon Yeon. Uh, Dr. Yeon is Professor Emeritus of Korean Language and Linguistics at the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, University of London. He also works as a visiting professor at the Academy of Korean Studies in Korea. Uh, he received his BA and MA in Linguistics at Seoul National University and his PhD in Linguistics at SOAS. Um, his research interests include a wide range of Korean lang linguistics, Korean language pedagogy, history, and structure of Korean language. He was a former president of European Association of Korean Language Education, International Circle of Korean Linguistics, and International Society of Korean Studies. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Yeon, uh, for joining us today. Um, let me also introduce our second panel. Um, Dr. Nico Nicola Proschini is a senior lecturer at the University of Melbourne Asia Institute, where he is the coordinator of the Korean language program. Um, he obtained his PhD from Korea University in Seoul 
and uh, previously worked at Sogang University Korean Language Education Center and also at the University of Western Australia. Uh, his research interests in, uh, include uh, foreign language learner and teacher emotions, motivation, and Q methodology. And then uh, he also published in journals such as the Modern Language Journal, Foreign Language Annals, and System. And then currently, he is the president of the Australian Association of Teachers of Korean, and he is the co author of Mission Accomplished. Korean a two volume textbook series for learners of Korean language. So uh, very delighted to see you again, uh, Dr. Nicola. Thank you. And then lastly, uh, let me introduce uh, Sexan uh, Anad Ananta Sarikiat. Uh, Sexan is currently a researcher at the ISC, International Studies Center and Advertising Director, uh, Korean Association of Thai Studies. Uh, he received Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from Chulalongkorn University and also Master of International Studies uh, from Seoul National University in Korea, with support from the Korea Foundation ASEAN Fellowship Program. Um, before joining the ISC, uh, Sexan worked as academic officer at the ASEAN Studies Center in Chulalongkorn University and researcher at the non-government think tank for national strategies. Um, his research interests cover Korean and ASEAN studies, public diplomacy, and national strategy for middle and small powers. And he contributed chapters for Korea's public diplomacy and Korea's soft power and public diplomacy and South Korea's new Southern policy. So it's always uh, lovely to see you, Sexan, in our event. Okay, so... Um, uh, from now on, uh, we will have a very short uh, presentation uh, from each panel. So we will call uh, Dr. Jehun Young first. So Dr. Young, if you're ready, the floor is yours. Okay, let me share my uh, presentation uh, PDF file. Um, hope you can see uh, this file, yeah? Okay. Um, I have prepared um, uh, 20 clips all together. So if I limit uh, 30 seconds per clip, then probably I will make the uh, time. I'll try. Okay, the topic uh, today is uh, Korean language education in Europe and globalization of uh, Korean. Um, before I um, 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 review uh, the Korean language education in Europe, I would like to make a remark that a lot of early work in Korean language education has been done by Western missionaries and Western scholars, such as um, um, Underwood, uh, James Gale, Homer Holberts, and Samuel Martin, Fred Luke of uh, Robert Ramsey, and so on. But um, uh, this has not been uh, acknowledged by Korean scholars in Korea, so we need to acknowledge and learn from non-Korean scholars. Um, as, as everybody knows, popularity of Korean language education over the last decade um, has been fueled by uh, the following factors. First, the increasing number of Korean learners due to interest in K-pop, K-drama, and Hallyu. And secondly, the increased positive perception of Korean dynamic culture and popularity of the Korean language. And thirdly, increased efforts of Korean government to globalize and to promote Korean language and K-culture. And we can characterize Korean language education in Korea as follows. Uh, first, um, there are movements towards unifying Korean language instruction, um, development of standard curriculum for worldwide Korean language education in Korean, uh, and also uh, there is a strong movement towards a communicative approach with increasing rejection of explicit grammar explanations and use of the student's mother tongue, um, in my case, uh, English. And however, research is still dominated by scholars employing contrastive analysis to examine the acquisition of grammar. So um, that's rather contrastive uh, situation. Also, the question remains whether teachers are accustomed to, accustomed to 
and able to apply a communicative approach successfully. And let me uh, review Korean language education in the West. Um, as I said before, important roles played um, by non-Korean scholars so far, but recent years have seen a preference for native uh, speaker Korean, uh, Korean teachers. And also um, we witnessed the great expansion in the last 10 to 20 years. And as a result, um, we, um, um, the uh, North America and Europe uh, both produced its own academic tradition, um, such as um, uh, American Association of Teachers of Korean uh, in, the, in North America, and they uh, published the journal, The Korean Language in America. Whereas in Europe, um, we organized the um, European Association of Korean Language Education. Um, we don't have uh, um, the journal yet, but um, every two years, um, the Korean teachers um, gather together and um, to present their research outputs. And currently, the Korean language is taught in over uh, 50 universities in more than 25 um, European countries as of uh, 2019. So the numbers um, must be uh, bigger than this um, uh, by now. And popularity of Korean language in European universities and European countries is simply amazing. It's unbelievable um, when, and to a uh, generation like me, the, um, the, the Korean uh, uh, middle-aged man, we never imagined um, uh, Korean become so popular. Um, I mean, uh, uh, if I'm allowed to, uh, the case of SOAS, uh, uh, when I first uh, taught um, Korean language at SOAS uh, 1989, uh, October, uh, the student numbers was only three, one student majoring in Korean and two students um, uh, double majoring in Korean. But uh, as of 2021, uh, Korean became the largest number of uh, uh, students um, uh, com in comparison with um, Chinese, Japanese, Arabic, uh, even uh, Korean uh, surpassed the numbers of other uh, widely taught languages such as Japanese, uh, uh, Chinese and Arabic. So this is amazing um, uh, fact. And in Western Europe, the majority of teachers are Korean nationals, uh, uh, whereas in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, due to the smaller number of Korean residents, teachers are often non-Korean nationals or Korean nationals post, uh, posted uh, to the host country, uh, typically by the Korea Foundation and Academy of Korean Studies. And teaching methods can be characterized by eclectic methodology. Um, I mean, a variety of programs and mixed use of textbooks published inside and outside of Korea. Um, and also teachers uh, major uh, uh, varied um, expertise, um, uh, ranging from linguistics and Korean language education to social science. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to move on the question of globalization of Korean language and script. Uh, so I'd like to raise a question whether the question of uh, globalizing is, is um, plausible or possible question. And the term globalization with respect to the Korean language and script uh, began to appear in the uh, mid 1990s. And Korean is ranked 14th in terms of native speakers. But if we count um, the number of students learning Korean as a foreign language, probably this rank around the same. Um, over the past 10 years, the number of foreigners taking the Korean language proficiency test um, topic has increased a lot. However, the main reason is because the Korean government requires foreign workers in Korea to take the test to get a visa. And the numbers in the Western countries such as the UK, France, uh, Germany, and so on, are still relatively small. Um, so if we look at the uh, native speakers, then uh, obviously Mandarin uh, Chinese is the first language, but uh, um, Korean um, occupies around um, uh, 14th. And <clears throat> Korean's value in the world language market appears to come very close to the top 10 to 15 languages on the basis of uh, both population figures and the number of learners. Um, 
So um, we can say that um, Korean still is not as popular as other widely taught languages in Western universities. Um, so if we look at statistics, um, 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 U.S. Uh, higher education um, 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 figures, um, um, the, the European high, higher education figures are not available to me. So um, uh, I, I brought this U.S. figure, but um, as you can see, uh, Korean occupies around 11th. Um, um, the first language taught in U.S. universities is Spanish, and, and also American Sign Language is around third. Um, but uh, if we look at 10 most used uh, internet language, um, obviously uh, English um, occupies more than half and Korean just come uh, 14, uh, 18th um, occupying 0.4% uh, only. So um, the, the written language um, uh, uh, um, is dominated by Roman alphabet, uh, which is English. So the question is globalization of the Korean script, Hangul then, uh, possible. Um, I don't know uh, whether you remember, but some years ago, Koreans were excited when it was reported that a tribe in Indonesia called Jia Jia had decided to adopt Hangul as its official script. Jia Jia is a small tribal language spoken by about 80,000 people on the island called Bhutan. But the question I like to um, raise is, why not Roman letters but Hangul if they adopt a, a script? Is Hangul a perfect and adequate script to write other languages than ha Korean? The answer is no. There are many speech sounds in world languages that Hangul cannot describe. No script can be perfect to write other languages in the world for which it was not designed. When I talk, um, uh, Hangul is a, um, a scientific and perfect script. Uh, it means it is perfect to write down the Korean language, not other uh, foreign languages. I mean, to take a few examples, Hangul cannot distinguish the following contrastive sounds in English, as you can see, pen, fen, van, seal and zeal, thank and this, light and right. Um, so um, there's no um, uh, perfect um, uh, writing systems to write down uh, other languages. And in addition, there are uh, ethical issues of globalizing Hangul. Indonesia is a multi-ethnic and multilingual country where linguistic policies are great concerns to its central government. So the import of a foreign script by a minority tribe could cause tension between the central government and local government. So the question, is globalization of the Korean language and script possible or plausible? The answer is maybe not impossible, but not easy. Um, here we, um, the words global and international are interchangeably used. That's another problem, but I like to skip this uh, issue. Um, so I have been very cautious um, um, what, uh, adopting this term globalization or, or um, uh, glo whether it's a Korean language or script. But uh, despite uh, this uh, cautious assessment on um, globalization of the Korean language and script, it is also true uh, that Korean language education has been developed a lot of the last decade and Korean has become very popular and it can become a global, uh, global language or global uh, language in the uh, near future, who knows. Um, so as, uh, as you can see this statistics, uh, the Korean uh, popularity has been increased um, uh, amazingly compared to even Japanese and Chinese. Um, in uh, US college and universities in 2013, uh, Japanese uh, decreased by uh, not uh, by seven percent, and Chinese um, increased only marginal two percent. But Korean has um, uh, increased its uh, student numbers uh, by forty-four um, percent. That is amazing uh, statistics. And more recent figures show uh, between two thousand six and two thousand sixteen, uh, uh, Chinese, Japanese, Arabic show. Uh, this uh, moderate um, increase, uh, whereas Korean um, uh, 
uh, shows some um, 95% increase in uh, student numbers. Uh, that shows some um, uh, extreme popularity by uh, student uh, bodies. And this is the um, um, uh, admission numbers uh, in France uh, universities. Um, um, the English statistics is not available, so it's written in Korean, but you can uh, easily see the um, the applicant numbers compared to um, admission quota. Uh, the the bottom line, uh, each university, this uh, blue uh, uh, number is like a 75, 40, 75, and so on. They, uh, that's an um, admission quota of each university in France. But um, uh, the gray uh, uh, point is um, applicants in 2021, and brown uh, color is an um, applicant's number in 2020. So uh, this applicant's number exceed uh, far greatly than uh, uh, admission quota. Uh, it shows again the popularity of um, uh, learners in, um, uh, in France. Um, and in this situation um, uh, is same in European universities. So then what's the contributing factors for this kind of development of Korean language education. Firstly, uh, we can see the popularity of contemporary Korean culture, Hallyu or Korean way. And uh, secondly, South Korea's increasing importance in the Northeast and a Northeast Asian and global economy. And also um, continued support for Korean language education and Korean studies overseas by uh, Korea Foundation, Academy of Korean Studies, and other governmental uh, institutions. And also recently, Sejong Institute have been in, uh, established um, in many countries, including Europe, and its support for global Korean language education uh, contributed to um, the development of uh, Korean language education. So these developments have made profound contributions to the progress of Korean language education, and the considerable success in spreading and promoting uh, Korean uh, language. Uh, but uh, what are problems and uh, are there any suggestions? Um, um, the Korean government's investment in Korean language education and its promotion policy need to be increased. Um, so the more the, the better. And lack of budget for the Sejong Institute need to be uh, appointed uh, out, uh, particularly compared with the uh, Confucius Institute, um, uh, the budget of Sejong Institute are uh, quite moderate and need to be um, uh, developed further. And also, Hallyu should be exploited as much as possible for Korean language spread policy. This is a good example of how non-economic affective factors can affect language popularity. And also unstable status of Korean language teachers and instructors need to be resolved. Currently, including uh, European universities adopting uh, neoliberal economic policies, um, uh, universities are uh, eager to um, increase their um, 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 income. So um, the position and status Korean language instructors um, have been very unstable. So this problem need to be um, um, tackled. Um, language spread policy might be a more suitable and appropriate policy rather than a globalization of Korea. So personally, I don't like to accept this term, a globalization of Korea. Finally, I'd like to make a final remarks as follows. Due to uh, popularity of contemporary Korean culture, Hallyu or K-pop, and South Korea's increasing importance in the global world, we have witnessed remarkable progress in Korean language education and considerable success in spreading and promoting Korean uh, during the last two decades. Nevertheless, globalization of the Korean language and script sounds like an ambitious slogan. I think um, Korean language spread policy or Korean language promotion policy might be more suitable, appropriate policy rather than globalization of Korean. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Okay, uh, 교수님, 감사합니다. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jaehyun Yeon. 
for a very comprehensive uh, introduction to the UK and uh, European uh, schools, uh, Korean studies, especially Korean language uh, education programs in different uh, schools and different regions. Um, I think uh, it's quite important that uh, Dr. Yeon mentioned uh, about the policy at the end. So perhaps in the discussion later, we can also uh, talk about it with other panels. So um, to continue, uh, we will now introduce, uh, we will now um, invite Dr. Nicola Fraschini uh, in the screen. So uh, Dr. Nicola, you can just go ahead. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? I think yes. Yeah. Hope you can hear me and thank you so much for inviting me to this event. I'm so glad to be to have the opportunity to share with you uh, what's going on about Korean studies in Australia. I didn't prepare uh, a PowerPoint like Professor Yoon, but I have a list of points that I can talk about and I hope to uh, make it into 10 minutes. So first, I want to spread uh, about uh, talking about Korean studies and Korean around the world has, that has already been done quite well by Professor Yoon before me. I will restrict my talk to Australia and this area of the world. First, uh, there are nine universities in Australia and New Zealand that have a Korean studies program. Actually, it's just one in New Zealand and eight in Australia. I want to add that, like, for example, at the University of Melbourne, Korean studies is not a major, it's just a minor. So there is uh, one university in New Zealand, Uni Melbourne with a minor, and there are seven universities with a major. So actually students can graduate in Korean studies. And what's important is that some university, for example, the University of Melbourne, the Korean studies program was launched in 2019, so it's quite recent. And before that, uh, Cutting University has been launched in 2023. So a brand new program has been established at Curtin University in Perth. And before that, a UWA, the Korean Studies program was launched in 2012. So you can see that the Korean Studies program has been introduced in three new universities over the past 10 years. And also, uh, I need to mention that there are other universities in Australia that even if they don't have a Korean studies program, they have a quite considerable numbers of scholars involved in Korean studies and they do teaching classes related to Korea, like related to Korea pop culture, for example, or Korean policies. And one of these universities is, for example, Macquarie University in Sydney. And also what I wanted to notice is that among these nine universities across Australia and New Zealand that host a Korean studies program, there are three AKS uh, core grants at the moment and the two past recipients, one is ANU and one is UWA. And there is at least one seeds grant, which is now at the moment here at the University of Melbourne. So what's the peculiarity, I would say, of Korean studies program in Australian universities compared in particular, I think, to the European context that has been explained before by Professor Yoon is the structure of the degree within which Korean studies usually sit. So with this, I want to uh, mean that if a student decides to study Korean studies, they don't take Korean studies, so they don't take only major related units from the beginning of their degree to the end of their degrees. Uh, for example, here at Uni Melbourne, but also at UWA, if they decide to uh, get a degree in Korean studies, they can also get usually a second major. So most students will graduate with two different majors, with a double major. And in many cases, Korean studies is elected as the second major. So this means that students get knowledge related to Korea, so in Korean studies, but also get knowledge of another scholarly field, for example, engineering or social sciences or arts or anything else that make their degrees much more spendable on the market, on the global market once they uh, graduate. Of course, 
in most Australian, in all Australian universities, Korean studies and Korean language subjects are also available as an elective. So it means that outside of their degree, students in commerce, for example, or in science that cannot major or they don't want to major in Korean studies, they are still able to take Korean language classes or Korean studies classes as an elective. And this contributed to the enormous growth in popularity on Korean studies. Just to give you a few numbers, uh, at the University of Melbourne, uh, we had more than 300 students now. And at the University of Western Australia, there has been a 66% increase in first year student numbers between 2015 and last year and 2022. I would say that across all Australia, student numbers, enrollments in Korean studies and in first level Korean language classes are healthy. So uh, we're not worried much about student numbers. I think that we are affected by another issue. Since Korean subjects and Korean language subjects are available as an elective, we can see huge numbers in first year subjects, like in Korean 1 and Korean 2, in basic Korean language classes. But I think we are affected by some retention programs. So that means that if we have more than 300 students in Korean 1, we will end up in Korean 6. So at the end of the third year, with about, well, if we are lucky, I think about 20 students, it depends on the university. And those 20 students usually are all the major students. So we have this issue that uh, huge numbers at the beginning, but then students numbers, they just fade off and, and fall away uh, in the second and in the third year. And we have been thinking there was also a conference in Auckland about Korean studies in Australia and New Zealand in February. And at the conference as well as uh, we thought about I mean, scholars involving Korean studies in Australia and New Zealand, we thought about what the issues about this retention and what can be done to fix it. I think that we can individuate a three, uh, three reasons that we might want to address. The first one is the lack of appropriate material for upper level students. We can see that there are a lot of introductory Korean, basic Korean, easy Korean, Hangul books. So a lot of resources that can be used actually in class to teach to entry level students, but there is overall a lack of Australia made and a lack of resources for upper level students. Most of the resources existing now have been produced in Korea and they fit the Korean context. But of course, they don't fit uh, the context of Korean studies overseas. And so there is the need to develop in locally here materials for upper level students so to motivate upper level students and to make it easier for them to reach higher level of the language. So that's the first reason probably. And then a second reason that probably we want to address is that I'm aware that in the case of European universities, a study abroad uh, period is in Korea is compulsory. And students have the opportunity actually to spend a year in Korea. And this is really important to uh, enable them to reach an upper level, a, a higher language proficiency. Unfortunately, for most Australian universities, opportunities for student exchanges are available, but they are not compulsory for a number of reasons that can be for the uh, lack of scholarships or lack of, say, lack of spots to be able to go to exchange to a Korean university. So uh, the introduction of more scholarship for students and the introduction of more opportunities for students to be able to go to Korea and to study, I think they are fundamental to grow student proficiency and to grow our numbers in the second and third year subjects. And another thing I want to point out is that Hallyu, as Professor Yoon has already mentioned, it's really important. 
it's important, but it could be, and this is what we are a bit worried about, that Halio is a strong motivator for entry-level Korean classes and for entry-level Korean students, but it could turn out to be a weak motivator to pursue Korean study at a way more advanced level. And this is probably another issue that we, as a scholar, as the Korean studies community, we want to address. Then, as I already mentioned, the enrollment trends is similar to Europe, so great popularity, but the course structure, as, as I already said, is way different from Europe. What we can offer here, usually as a, as a subject, is a language subject a semester, but like I assume it's happening in Europe, but the difference that there are with other countries in Southeast Asia and in Europe is that the amount of face-to-face -face of classroom hours for Korean language classes is really reduced. In most cases, we are talking about four hours a week. That's for Korean, the first, second, and third year as well. And you can also, you can uh, of course see that four hours a week is not uh, a amount of time that is sufficient to grow up a level uh, proficiency. A good thing that uh, we recently introduced at Uni Melbourne is that a Korean studies will be elected as a major, so it will be turned into a major from 2024, so next year. And in our uh, program, there is a capstone unit in the third year, which is not a language unit, which is a unit about Korean politics and society. And the capstone unit is designed to give students hands-on experience in the Korean studies field through internship in the local Korean research center or in to allow them to run or to participate in activities where can they use the language knowledge they acquired through the third year and the knowledge they acquired about Korea through the, the three years of their degrees. And also another recent development, always here at the University of Melbourne, is that uh, with the support of the Korea Resource Center, we will launch a Korean language teacher training program in August this year, because we recognize the need to train Korean language teachers here locally. So we need Australian people able to teach Korean, and we need Korean people with knowledge of the Australian context that are able to teach Korean, not just to university students, but also to primary uh, and high school students. And this uh, led me to my third point, which is about linking the secondary level and the tertiary level, linking high school Korean language teaching with university Korean language teaching. We might not be aware that uh, there are a lot of countries around the world where Korean language is taught at the high school level too. However, there are just a hand, there is just a handful of countries that have a Korean language curriculum. So a Korean language syllabus, which has been designed locally, approved by the local Ministry of Education and used for teaching in high school. And these countries are just Thailand, Malaysia, Vietnam, Australia, and New Zealand. So I'm not saying country where uh, Korean is taught in high school, but Korean is taught in high school with a locally developed curriculum. And for this reason, there is a need in Australia to link better the high school curriculum with the university curriculum. Usually it happens in most cases, for example, in Western Australia or, or in New South Wales, that the end of the year 12 of the non-background uh, Korean language learners curriculum is roughly equivalent to when we start at the university level, the second year classes. So students that have done Korean in high school can come to university and start learning Korean from the second year. So they skip the, the first year. For this reason, in many Australian universities, there are upper level Korean language classes that are taken by students who enter the university on this separate level. 
So for example, if a student has never done Korean in high school, they will do Korean at university from Korean 1 to Korean 6. On the other hand, if they have done Korean language in high school, they will take Korean language classes from Korean 3 to Korean 8. This pathway is not available in all university, but it's a way that is in place in some university to allow students that have done Korean in high school to complete all the credits requirements that will uh, make them uh, able to pursue a major degree in Korean studies. Then I think that another thing that for this reason, what we need in Australia is a bit more of interactions between uh, uni the university sector and the high school sectors. I know that, for example, the European Association for Korean Language Education is restricted to uh, the university sectors. While here in Australia, we do have an Australian Association of Teachers of Korean, but we gather together university academics and high school teachers. So, and we run also workshop together so that we can see what are the common issues. Uh, another issue that we have in Australian University is the high numbers of background students or of Korean heritage learners and the challenges that we have into accommodating those students into regular language classes and into getting those students able to complete the credit requirements and to get a degree in Korean studies. Also, uh, a, a further challenge that it might be common also to other places in the world is that sometimes university administrators are not always keen on promoting languages, foreign languages and foreign culture learnings. A last point that I wish to touch before uh, leading to the next speakers is regarding future uh, Koreanists and nurturing and fostering the next generation of uh, Korean study scholars. Well, everybody in all universities here in Australia are keen on getting uh, PhD students, on getting graduate, postgraduate students able to do, uh, in our case, Korean studies. The problem is that, that now the problem facing Australian universities is that the newly released statistics shows that only a small percentage of PhD students actually uh, are able to get a job in academia. So it's a, a balancing aspect that we need to consider between nurturing the next generation of Korean study scholars and the possibility that all the next generation of PhD students in Korean studies will be actually able to work in the Korean studies. And I might have a few more points, but I think I'm already running over time. So I stop here for now, but I'm happy to take any other questions uh, after the next panelist. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nicola. I think uh, it's also very interesting how the, the situation in Australia, and then he also mentioned uh, New Zealand, um, is quite different from European countries and also uh, Asia, especially Southeast Asia, where the Philippines and Thailand are situated. So uh, I also had some um, curiosity on um, like uh, what kind of uh, collaborations among the, the Australian universities locally within Australia you are really uh, forging uh, to work together. And also I think it's um quite uh interesting to know if uh korean language program in uh, australian basic education sectors are really very well sustained because that's what uh we usually hear from even from korean media so maybe these things uh we can also discuss uh with uh dr yun and sexan later on so uh let us welcome our third uh, panel sexan from thailand so sexan it's your turn
All right. Um, sorry for technical problems. Um, greetings, Saudi Krab. Hello, my name is Sexan and has regret as um, already introduced by Dr. Pe. Before I start, I'd like to make a disclaimer that this presentation is uh, my personal views. They do not reflect those of uh, my current offices. Um, I would like to thank the UPKRC, my Pitong Meng or Blood Alliance, <laughs> as um, uh, for your kind invitation. Uh, for my presentation, I would rather call it uh, observations on Korean studies in ASEAN because I did not conduct any exact uh, the research on any exact numbers um, of students and also curriculums, but I have reviewed some of them and I, I made some points here. Uh, my argument, I would like to call it as think globally, act regionally. Um, I agree with Professor Yon that we are moving towards a uh, unifying trend on Korean language education because it seems that we share uh, similar courses, we share similar concerns and also context uh, in several issues. But at the same time, we also practice Korean studies in our ways, depending on the, uh, the context and also our environments. So I will start with the, the first one. Um, I think in case of Southeast Asia or ASEAN, it seems that there is a push factor. Korean studies is not that popular, let's say before uh, 2010's decades. But I think the advent of the K-pop or Hallyu, uh, K-things, K-content industry came to the region. Then I found that uh, we re receive a lot of uh, keen interest from our audience and students. Um, as you can see from this uh, presentation, you will see that on the right uh, top one, you will see that the Royal Thai Embassy, no, not Thai Embassy, there was a Korea, the Korean Embassy in Bangkok organized an event following to the Squid Game by making it like more um, reachable to the Thai media. And on the right side, you see that uh, there are top 20 countries tweeting about K content. Korea is exactly the first one. But the second one is Thailand. And you will see a lot of ASEAN countries here, including the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, Singapore. So most ASEAN studies are here in top 20, uh, tweeting most about K-content. And they engage proactively in discussing the situations in South Korea. And at the same time, they reflect what Korea has experienced to their own country's experiences at the same time. In Thailand, I would say that online activism mostly uh, from K-pop fandom. Very interesting. Um, you will see the photo of Lisa here. I think um, the music video, this music video, La Lisa, met the issue of soft power and also uh, popularity of K-pop, bring it back to the interest of the Thai society. Because after releasing this video, um, Lisa and also something about Korea or K content or K popularity has been risen uh, increasingly in the Thai society. And on the right side, you will see the BTS. I would say that BTS has really strong fandom um, in the ASEAN region. In some countries such as Indonesia, um, there is an activity by the K-pop fandom themselves, such as like blood donation and also uh, plantation. So I think these kind of things kind of blend Korean studies into um, the kind of like the interest of the society. Myself, I can say that um, after Lalisa video, I received a lot of invitation to talk more about Korea because the Thai media always says that we know Korea, but we have no knowledge about Korea. And this is what happening in the ASEAN region due to the rise of the KOF. When it comes to the practices of Korean studies in our region, first point, I would say that we found that it's more about language and culture rather than Korean studies. Um, I think there are nine government universities teaching Korean language as major. Even Jualongkorn University, one of the top universities in the country, just started the major in Korean language just like uh, these 10 years. So I think this is a kind of trend following to the rise of the K-pop in the region. 
Second point I would say that there are research institutions and programs in Korean studies that are very, very active. And exactly UPKRC is the most proactive one. I think this is the advantage of the Philippines as an English speaking, speaking country. So the UPKRC has a kind of lot of engagements and also strong networks with many professors. So those who cannot speak Korean well, like me, I would say that also some people say that, oh, s e x a n is like a case study scholar, but my Korean is not that good. So this is the way that I can engage with the world on Korean studies through English language. Why some people may be comfortable with the UPKRC because yes, uh, Professor Pei Kyung Min is uh, speak Korean very well, so they have more comfortability to deal with the UPKRC. So I think this is a kind of things that happening. Second, I would say that Malaysia University of Malaya, the Malaysia Korea Research Center, is another active one. Um, Professor uh, Kim Kim Yeon is also very very active on this, and there are a lot of research, including like Korean language, Korean idioms, and also uh, several issues on Korean studies. Third, uh, this is recent uh, research institute, the Korea Center on the East Asian Institute uh, in US. This is, I think, recently established just a few years ago, and this center, uh, the head of the center, Professor Lam Peng Er, he is actually the expert on Japanese studies. This is also a trend in Thailand as well that those who turn to be Korean studies professors was or were um, kind of like professors in Japanese studies before. I think this is interesting, depending on um, the engagement of. ASEAN dialogue partners, like including China, Japan. I mean, other dialogue partners engagement here. Like some we have India, Indian studies. So I think this happening um, as like a crowded field. Let's say. Uh, next, I think in case of Thailand, it seems that uh, there are center for Korean studies at the Institute of East Asian Studies, t h a m m a s a t University, and also the project, so called KSEP, Korean Studies Education Project Development. Um, this project collected scholars from t h u a l o n g k o n University, t h a m m a s a t University, and Chiang Mai University. Those who speak Korean and did not speak Korean together to research more, to teach more about Korea. Um, there is a course on Korean studies. Actually, Korean studies is I think is very famous for many Thai students. So many universities in Thailand open Korean studies or Korea Today. As a general course for um, the university uh, students, so this project is actually at intent to bring our scholars to teach. Um, some scholars are from faculty of political faculty of science, faculty of uh, veterinary science. I mean, those from the natural sciences also come to teach about Korea from their own perspective. So I think this is a kind of new. Way that we try to develop Korean studies, engage more interdisciplinary professors to give life of Korean studies. When it comes to the term of methodologies, I would say that when I review um, Master of Art thesis or individual research, I found that most of them prefer using comparative analysis rather than in-depth research. Perhaps because of limitation in Korean proficiency. That's why many students in political science or social sciences they may prefer studying Korea from English sources, but those who study in um, Korean language major or literature major, they may prefer doing in-depth research. But at the same time, they may lack of disciplinary analysis. So I think this is a mismatch that we are having in Thailand now. Those who can uh, speak Korean may not have any approach. To sharpen um, the arguments, but those who have very high proficiency may not have any kind of like uh, in, in the same way, the opposite way. I think next, and it's very important. There are several Korean institutions. I mean, from Korea, try to um, support or write the Korean wave to promote Korea overall um, dimensions. Those include Korean cultural centers. Korea Foundation offices in Hanoi and Jakarta, so only two offices of Korea Foundation here. Also, Academy of Korean Studies or AKS. I'm sorry, I did not put it here, but AKS I think has very important in promoting Korean studies, especially Korean language education, and also alumni networks. 
um, I proposed to the embassy here in Bangkok, the Korean embassy in Bangkok, that we should also build a network. So Korean studies is not just about you studying about Korea and that's it, or that's your background. No, it should not be that way. We should make a network of those who engage with Korea and bring their experiences to make Korean studies more lively. Not just we have a kind of like um, programs from Korea and we do this, do this, and not like not like that, but it should be more lively. So this is my suggestion. Um, and also key catalyst. Interestingly, um, Professor Bear also and I also joined this network, the Korean Studies Association of Southeast Asia, KOSASA, run by Professor Kwon Sung Ho and the late Professor So Chong Sok. Um, he's currently executive director of the Korea Research Initiative at the University of New South Wales. So it's actually Korea, Australia, ASEAN trilateral networks of Korean studies. And this COSASA actually um, has run for more than 20 years. So this is an interesting issue. I will not spend more time here, but I would think I will list uh, some points for discussion, for the discussion. First, I would like to raise more about Korean studies as discipline. I think Korea has to compete with other countries uh, in order to make kind of country studies more sustainable. Um, Japanese studies was the previous trend, I think, in many countries in Southeast Asia. Now we face Chinese studies, Indian studies, but I would say that Korean studies still have advantage because of the Korean wave in the region. Second, I think I would like to bring North Korea into Korean studies. It seems that when we talk about Korean studies, we always miss North Korea here. This is what I observe even in South Korea when I study at Seoul National University. But there, there is a seminar on North Korea. So I try to bring that course to open in Master of Arts in Korean Study at Jolongkorn University. And last year, I was invited to teach the course. But I think we, at least I still see necessity that we should promote or have a position of North Korea in the Korean studies. Third, I think it's about future direction of uh, disciplinary development. This is perhaps another key issue that we should discuss later. How should we develop our Korean studies? Uh, deeper, wider, or in any ways, multidisciplinary? Yeah, so just some, some points. Second point is about ecosystem. And this is really important because I think Professor Nicola mentioned already about um, secondary school. I can say that uh, just last year, last year, that Korean studies gained more interest than Japanese studies in secondary school. I mean, in, num in the term of uh, number of students and also kind of language centers. So Korean studies now, it seems as like number one country studies uh, in Thailand. So it is really important. But I would say that we should make further collaborations among ASEAN institutions. We should make ASEAN nice Korean studies, just some ideas that we can discuss later. I think I see more regionalized Korean studies because we share similar context. We share um, kind of interest in K-pop, K-wave and other K things. And also we have, I think most of language courses are like in very similar, like on uh, listening, reading, Korean for media, Korean for tourism, Korean um, for business, but we need more content on Korean studies. This is my personal argument to put more for those even who study Korean language. Uh, next point is about sustainability of Korean wave. Should we depend on Korean wave in order to sustain and develop Korean studies? Uh, I think we have a lot of discussions. When I go to teach uh, teachers who will teach students in secondary school, they always raise this issue. Will K-pop sustainable? Yeah, I think this is not the issue. Then then how can we develop? Um, I think we, we don't have the problems of less students here in ASEAN these years, but in the future, we are not sure. How can we sustain uh, the, the Korean studies without KWF? Yeah, just imagine about it. I think the last point, I think this is just, just for fun. I mean, AI for Korean studies. I think the advent of AI uh, made me think about kind of um, I asked the chat GPT to make a curriculum of Korean studies for me. And it's really interesting because uh, it suggests like very wide about Korea. 
and this is actually what k s e p project in j u l a l u n g k o n and Chiang Mai Thammasat did before. We try to expand the frontier of knowledge on Korea, such as like Korea innovation, Korean food, uh, Korean science, technology, and also yeah, I think this is uh, perhaps the future that we should. Uh, think about it more, and I'm looking forward to further discussion. Thank you, Rishi, for your interest. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sexan. Um, uh, I think uh, compared to uh, Dr. Yan and Nicola, uh, we can also add some uh, regional issues because uh, Philippines is also part of Southeast Asia, and then uh, we also belong to ASEAN when it comes to education. So uh, perhaps later on, because we are all from uh, different continents and regions, uh, we can focus on uh, these uh, issues together. So um, for the the discussion. Um, we can uh, everyone will join the panel discussion, and then you can just freely share, exchange, share and exchange ideas and insight. And then, uh, if you haven't um, added uh, some some crucial information earlier during your presentation, you can just add it uh, anytime. So just feel free uh, to butt in and uh, to talk about uh, different things uh, for each other. And then, while our panels are um, doing uh, interactions, uh, our audience can also leave uh, their questions and comments in the comment section on on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. So uh, those questions and comments will be read and answered by our panels. So, um, for our panel discussion, um, I will also um, type in. Uh, the question in our chat box, but uh, I think Pam, we also show it on the screen for our audience. So uh, the first question uh, we thought of was, in the presentation, uh, most of you really mentioned uh, the impact of Hallyu and how it really strongly uh, drives uh, interest in taking Korea-related courses, not only language courses but content courses. So what would you say? Uh, how different uh, Korean studies is perceived? If there's any significance pre Hallyu and post Hallyu, so perhaps uh, since uh, we can see the longest history of uh, offering Korean language and uh, studies courses in the UK, perhaps we can ask Dr. Yan first. Right, um, I mentioned um, K-pop and Hallyu um, certainly contributed. Um, Increase of student numbers and student interest in Korean studies, but um, as um, Dr. Prastini uh, pointed out, it does not necessarily mean uh, this student interest um, uh, what will uh, continue as an academic uh, interest and academic subject, uh, which I totally agree with him. And um, but um, um, it's another matter uh, whether Hallyu. Uh, can be treated as an academic subject and also whether it can be continued. But uh, I, I think nobody knows uh, how long it will continue and this popularity will go on. But, um, 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 but um, probably uh, 20 years ago, people said um, oh, Hallyu will not continue for long, but um, it still survived. So nobody knows. And I mean, nobody predicted um, uh, Germany reunification, and um, um, so we cannot simply predict how long it will continue. But what I uh, mentioned is simply uh, just um, uh, use and exploit uh, this um, 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 interest of Hallyu or student interest as a kind of input for uh, admission of student um, uh, intake in Korean studies. But um, I'm not quite sure whether uh, Hallyu can be uh, formulated as an academic subject. Um, I mean, to be uh, frankly speaking, uh, I'm quite dubious about it. And also this current um, trends in Korean studies uh, focusing on contemporary Korean culture um, as, as a um, kind of traditional um, Korean studies scholar. I'm old fashioned uh, grammarian. And um, so um, I personally don't uh, like this uh, current um, uh, trend, but um, um, as, as a 
as a um, um, phenomenon, uh, we uh, simply accept the um, current situation. Right. Yeah, I think, uh, like Dr. Yan mentioned, uh, when it comes to Hallyu, there's always a discussion of sustainability, like how long it will continue and how much impact it will they make uh, in terms of Korean studies. How about uh, Dr. Nicola, if you want yes, to add I something? Want, yes, I, I want to find this number, found it. Um, just uh, to top on that, as you mentioned at the beginning, I, I have researched uh, learner motivation. And sometimes I get to review papers on learning motivation. And I think that uh, thinking that Hallyu is driving uh, the growth in enrollment, it is just a small part of the truth. And I think that the picture behind learners' motivation is way much more complex. And I wanted to bring this example of what happened in Australia with Korean and Japanese from the 90s. Uh, in the 90s, the Australian government uh, invested four, $400 million, a huge amount of money, into the secondary level teaching of just four languages. That was Indonesian, Korean, Japanese, and Chinese. And that was the end of the mid to the end of the 90s. And the Korean uh, language growth was near to not zero, but it, 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 Korean usually it is indicated as a failure about that program. And one of the most successful, probably the single most successful language of that program, of that funding, is Japanese. What Japanese did is to create a series of locally made resources. And now Japanese is the single most popular foreign language in Australian high schools. And there is a huge number of Australian teachers, so not Japanese people, like Australian teaching Japanese. And, and thinking about how that has been possible, it was not just probably because of the funding and the push coming from within Australia at the time, was also that in the second half of the 90s, the Japanese government was also pushing in the same direction. So there was this willingness and the funding availabilities and the positive perception from both within and from outside. If you think about what happened in Korea in the second half of the 90s, you can't see that there was the possibility with the IMF, there was the possibility of the government pushing funding into the fostering Korean language overseas. There was not the same funding availability Japanese had. And, and with the death of Kim Il-sung, it was not even possible perhaps to say that Korea has a positive uh, perception overseas. So there was funding and possibility within, but there was not the push from outside. And, and that's probably one of the main reasons. So what happened in the recent years instead is not just that, is the atmosphere is much more favorable. You have seen that the Korean government through, uh, I, I'm one of the example, I've been able to study and get my degrees all thanks to scholarship from the Korean government. So you can see that from the past 10, 20 years instead, even from Korea, there has been much more funding availability to push for Korean studies overseas, for Korean language. And within this, now you have the Hallyu that is contributing to building a positive image. So I think that Hallyu, in, in now in 2023, I would say that Hallyu is a factor, an important factor, but it's not the, sin the, the single factor. Okay, maybe we can continue. Yeah, 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 correct. So maybe we can continue to hear from Sexan. All right, I totally agree with Professor Nicola. I think with or without Hallyu, Korean studies may grow with support by the Korean government through several organizations. Yeah, I think this is perhaps 
a uh, trend the, the word the professor Yun doesn't like a lot about it yeah perhaps it's maybe the, the way in the, in the future yeah. with or without Hallyu. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, if I may add, uh, the Philippine situation, like uh, all of you mentioned, uh, Hallyu cannot really be ignored anymore because this is really initial uh, motivation of most students in higher educational institutions in the Philippines as well. And then um, some somewhat uh, different trends are observed uh, at least past uh, 10 or 15 years because like uh, Nicola just mentioned, uh, Korean government has been pouring quite a lot of money uh, to attract foreign students and also give a uh, quite big amount of scholarship. So uh, beyond Hallyu, I think um, some students are turning the direction uh, if they can do something else beyond uh, their personal interest and also uh, use uh, their skills in language and uh, Korean studies um, in, in the career or some, something else uh, outside school. Um, so um, I think the, the second question we prepared is also uh, connected. Um, maybe uh, Pam can show the, the second question I typed in. Um, so um, I think earlier, um, uh, Sexton especially mentioned uh, what kind of uh, uh, jobs um, some some Koreanists uh, in Thailand are pursuing or considering. So I was also wondering what career path uh, do your students in the UK, Australia, and Thailand uh, who take Korean language or Korean studies uh, really pursue after they finish uh, their degree or tra training program? Because earlier Nicola also mentioned uh, the global job market is uh, demanding uh, some necessary skills. So uh, when Korean is offered for it as an elective course, it's quite attractive, right? Because it's not really the major course uh, that, that burdens uh, their degree program. So um, maybe uh, if you have observed any trend, uh, can you share any insights on this? Trend about jobs or trend about research? Because there was also a question about research. Well, I start with jobs, if, if, if that's okay. Um, as, I, as I said before, uh, with, with a degree in Korean studies, people can be, uh, can do, uh, I would say, whatever they want. And I'm saying this because, as I said before, most students in Australian universities, uh, they are able, to, at least here in Melbourne and in Perth, they are able to do two majors. And usually they select two majors from two very different fields in most cases. I had students uh, doing engineering and Korean studies, not one of them, more of them. And, and what happened to those students, for example, is that, well, this is an extreme case, of course, but it happened that, I don't know if you ever heard about Woodside. Woodside is a big in, uh, mining company and energy company in Australia. And they had got an offer from Woodside even before they finished graduating. Just because if they have 10 curriculum of fresh graduates and engineers, they just have probably one of them with knowledge about Korea. And, and they need people able to interact with Korea because Korea is big for the energy market. And with this one, I want to say that uh, I think that we, we need to tell our students, like, it would be great to work for Samsung. It would be great to work for Hanwha, for example. And there is Hanwha in Australia. But Hanwha wants engineers. They don't want Korean studies people. So it would be good to, to be realistic with our students. Well, they, they would be great diplomats, our students. A lot of our students can be journalists, diplomats can work in many different fields, but I think they we, we need to be realistic on, on what they do. And I think that our students should be aware that what they do with Korean, the Korean language and the Korean, they know less about Korea, it probably much depends also on other skills in other fields that they might have. 
Right. If I can add, yes, um, right. Um, um, career path and job market situation all depends on uh, which country you are living in. And it also depends in whether it's Western Europe or Eastern Europe. <clears throat> and um, if I'm um, correct, um, I was told that um, a graduate of Korean studies in Vietnam universities, probably they would love to work in Korea related um, companies such as Samsung and Hyundai. But um, in Western Europe, uh, working in Korea related company is not a decent job. Uh, uh, so um, they can work in uh, any field um, you like. Um, and also the correlation between the major subject you, uh, the, the uh, subject you majored in university and the uh, uh, working sector after graduation is not very um, uh, uh, correlated uh, in Western Europe at least. For instance, um, graduate of uh, Korean, Chinese, Japanese language and culture departments could work in finance section or engineering industry or aviation sector or teachers or uh, can be unemployed if you like. And um, it all depends on your training uh, you get um, in um, each companies that you will work. Um, so the qualification you will get and also the qualification the companies are seeking for is that if you graduated um, um, uh, language and culture department of Korea, Japan, uh, Arabic and Chinese, then you have an intelligence that um, uh, complete your degree in such and such uh, difficult languages. Then you have an intelligence in working in any sector uh, after such and such amount of time. And so you can work any sector. But in Europe, uh, Western European, uh, Eastern European countries, um, I mean, the Korean studies graduates still love to work in um, Korean embassy or Korean companies such as Samsung, Hyundai, and Kia. So it all depends on uh, 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 different cases, I would say. Thank you. Yeah, Sexan. Yeah, I, I agree with the uh, professors. I think it's very similar to the case of Thailand. Uh, in Thailand, the top three um, works for those who graduate from Korean studies. Uh, first is the yeah, uh, staff in Korean institutions, companies, embassies. Yeah. Uh, second, I think what I think is like uh, translators. Yeah, translators and also uh, both speaking and writing. And third, uh, Korean language teachers. So it seems that these are like the, the current trends. So some of them, they, when they graduate, they just open the uh, course, like online course. Yeah, it's, it's open for small groups, like 10 students, 20 students. Yeah, I think this is a new hobby yeah, for those who graduate from Korean studies. Yeah, I think uh, this uh, this information is quite uh, important to all of us because like uh, Dr. Yeon just uh, mentioned, it really depends on the regions and then qualification the, the companies or institutions are really seeking. So I maybe a Philippine case, uh, just to share with uh, our panels, um, is somewhat similar to Vietnam or Thailand because uh, uh, we, we teach Asian students and then uh, the, the growing number of Korean companies in the region is really uh, somewhat uh, significant. So those students, uh, especially in the Philippines, because English is the official language, um, they were not really required to speak Korean, even if they work in a Korean company. But these days, the trend is somewhat changing and uh, more than English and more than their main discipline, um, Korean skills is, are quite uh, demanding because it's quite rare to have uh, the, the high qualified, um, skilled um, um, employees. So perhaps uh, we can also look at other research uh, later on so we can understand uh, what's really going on in other regions as well. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, next one is um, 
I will just show you the question first here. So, um, especially like in the UK or in Australia, because um, in, in Asia, uh, like uh, the, the, the Association of Korean Studies, uh, Sexans University and my university belong to, um, is quite familiar what kind of universities are in Asia. But when it comes to the UK, uh, Australia, we know the names like SOAS and then uh, other like, like Edinburgh University also has Korean studies program, right? So um, we know the names, but uh, we are also curious how distinctive or how different uh, depending on the regions or institutions uh, in, in terms of offering programs or perhaps the outcomes of research. Perhaps uh, we can ask Dr. Yan first. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, um, I would say that um, there are differences and different traditions and distinctiveness uh, uh, depending on uh, countries and institutions. Um, and I mean, broadly speaking, um, European tradition is um, uh, quite strong in pre-modern Korean uh, uh, studies, like um, um, I mean. Um, um, Joseon dynasty history and uh, pre-modern Korean language uh, um, and so on. Compared to uh, North America, um, uh, um, well, uh, social science is quite uh, strong compared to European studies, but uh, pre-modern Korean studies scholar is quite lacking in North America. And within, uh, within Britain and also different traditions um, maintained and so as uh, has been renowned for uh, language and culture studies, uh, focusing on um, history and language and literature studies, whereas um, Sheffield University is comparatively strong in social science. Um, um, compared uh, to uh, SOAS uh, tradition. And uh, Edinburgh uh, and the other universities, quite recent um, uh, development in Korean studies. So it is quite difficult to say tradition, but um, um, their focus is uh, still on uh, modern Korean studies rather than pre-modern Korean studies. And um, broadly speaking in Europe, um, I mean, the history of Korean language and Korean studies uh, have been quite long. Um, I mean, 40 years, 60 years, even 100 years, uh, talking of um, uh, Leiden University in Netherlands uh, and so on, except for um, uh, Oslo University in Norway and Italy uh, and Spain, uh, where uh, Korean studies developed since uh, 2000 uh, uh, afterwards. Uh, so uh, traditions and distinctiveness is quite uh, uh, remarkable in that way. Thank you. Okay, uh, Sexan or Nicola, whoever wishes to say. You, you can go first. Um, I think most of um, Southeast Asian institutions, we teach more contemporary Korean studies and modern and contemporary Korean studies. And um, even in Thailand, it seems that mostly our history, the Korean history, right? And also more modern and contemporary studies. Well, in Australia, it's, it's quite uh, young comparatively. And I would say that most universities are oriented toward the social sciences. There is not much pre-modern Korean things. Um, how about, uh, uh, because uh, our university is also in the capital city, but uh, maybe I can ask Dr. Yun and uh, Dr. Nicola, how about in the UK and Australia, is it, uh, distinctive or any significance uh, whether you're in London or in other cities or regions are there any differences as well yes certainly there are differences and there are pros and cons locating in capital cities like London I mean certainly uh, the benefit of uh, locating in uh, uh, um, a metropolitan city London is um, recruiting and attracting many international students and also, uh, we are very um, uh, easy to access um, um, 
cultural um, uh, amenities and some um, um, such as uh, British Museum and British Library and so on and also lots of cultural events some um, taking place uh, during term times uh, so that's an attractive uh, part of um, uh, students point of view but uh, uh, obviously uh, the um, uh, bad thing is the uh, high price, um, uh, expensive uh, living expenses in London. So that's the um, 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 kind of um, uh, repulsive point from um, student point of view. So um, living in Sheffield, for instance, is uh, living expenses is less than half of um, um, uh, living in uh, um, uh, London. So that's a certain uh, differences. Oh, that's quite big, half. <laughs> yeah. oh, how about in Australia? Uh, well, considering I, I recently moved from Perth to Melbourne, I can I can confirm the prices in Melbourne are much more expensive than Perth. But beyond that, uh, I think that the, the problem is not much being or not being a capital city. Because in the case of Australia, Sydney and, and Melbourne are, are much bigger than Canberra. So I, I don't think the problem here is with the capital city. Is the access is being near to the access that you need to do your job. For for example, in Perth there is no Korean consulate. And from Perth to get to Sydney, it's a five-hour flight, so it's three time zones. While just with just with being here in Melbourne, you have access to the Korean consulate. You are much near to conference. You you can go, you can drive to Canberra. You don't need to take the flight, for example. It's a bit far, but you can do that. And so and, and also other like Australian uh, foundations that support Asian studies are located here in Melbourne and it's just a matter for me to walk down the street, cross the crossroad and get into their office for example. So from that point of view I think that's the difference is that all these institutions are located in the big cities whether the big city in many countries is the capital city in other country it might be not the capital city. Yeah, yeah, I think the geography in Australia is also very different from uh, where we live. How about uh, Sexton? Because in, in your, I think, second slide, you mentioned some names of uh, Thai universities. But aside from those universities, are there any new, rather small universities that attempt to develop Korean studies program? Yeah, I can say that the curriculum is quite standardized here. So we teach the same thing with, um, let's say, similar expertise by professors. But the different things is about amenities, is about environment that could welcome more international students and also the places to work after graduation. I think that's the point. Yeah. Mm, okay, I think uh, it really enlightens myself as well, but I think our audience uh, should be aware what is really different in other regions and continents especially. Um, next question is uh, a bit, uh, we, we can move uh, from discussing pedagogy and programs um, because uh, when in, in the Philippines, when we witness what is really uh, going on in terms of Korean culture, uh, because that is really uh, one of the main motivations for our students, um, is, is there any trend in Korean studies uh, research or academic events that cater the, your local or international scholars or even public. For instance, uh, in the UK, um, past a few years, uh, we really witnessed there was so much um, events and research going on in um, about Korean literature. And then there was so much events, it's especially like uh, Man Booker Prize is held in the UK. It's very uh, meaningful for the, the literary people. So. Is there any uh, notable event or the, the research agenda you can really witness? Maybe Professor Yan first. Thank you. Um, I mean, uh, the research trends shift and also institutional focus shift um, 
uh, that can be witnessed. This is certainly uh, this uh, a neo <laughs> neoliberal uh, uh, market policy adopted by university. So the trend is that um, uh, shift from traditional academic subject to uh, kind of contemporary um, popular culture, uh, which I do not uh, agree and uh, welcome uh, very much, but it is a trend, uh, so cannot be uh, um, stoppable by uh, one or two scholars like me. Um, so, uh, and also this uh, traditional uh, subject like um, um, uh, linguistics and theoretical linguistics and uh, um, um, uh, pre-modern Korean literature or even history uh, is uh, quite sidelined and um, institution like to um, um, recruit um, person who can teach um, popular Korean cultures. Um, so uh, that's the trend and also um, in terms of uh, language, Korean language teaching, um, um, I quite um, um, doubt that the uh, academic position in theoretical linguistics like me uh, will be uh, disappeared in uh, uh, sooner or later near future and will be replaced by um, a teaching only position. Um, that is why I mentioned the position and um, status of Korean language instructors and Korean language um, teachers are uh, unstable and need to be uh, tackled and resolved. Uh, but this is a trend. So at least in North America and European universities, um, um, uh, as an academic subject, linguistics uh, is quite um, uh, dangerous position, unstable position, and which is uh, also the case for uh, uh, traditional history teaching and uh, um, um, literature teaching as well. So um, contemporary Korean culture is um, um, uh, rising and um, getting uh, more and more popular and um, students uh, like to learn uh, those things, uh, including media studies and film studies and so on. So this is some um, uh, re irresistible um, kind of um, trends um, happening in um, Western um, universities, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah. Um, Nicola? Yeah, I, I share the same concerns as Professor Yun, in particular regarding the increase in teaching only position for Korean language. And and I'm saying this from a position probably of from of one from the few lucky ones. And I have no words that. And then on the other hand, I'm not sure if the the reason of the questions of this specific question regards uh, research trends. So when you become already a researcher and you have to select your research topic for your thesis, what are the trends now? So that's the meaning. I I would like to invite thinking about what's Korean studies. And, and I like people and, and young researchers in particular to think that Korean studies, it's an interdisciplinary field. And that you can also see that in, in, among this panel, you have people working on a language like Professor Yun and myself, and, and perhaps people working also on policies. It's really two really different things, but nevertheless, we are together under career studies. So I think that uh, research trends depend in, in career studies it depends much on the, of course, there is a lot of interest in Hallyu and in pop culture, of course, but uh, like I I was looking, for example, at the program of the, of the upcoming XA in Europe, the European Association for Korean Studies. And, and honestly, I can see that there are a lot of presentations that are interesting to me, that I might want to, uh, I'm not going, but I would like to hear because of my interest about Korea, but the accent in itself 
it's a conference that I hardly see myself fit into it because there is very little space for language and for language education now. So I would rather go to conference that perhaps are not about Korean studies, but it, where I can show my research done on Korean language, for example. So I think that regarding, this is to say that regarding research trends, it depends on, on what you're interested in and what aspect of Korea are you looking at? Are you looking at the language? Are you looking at the international relation? Are you looking for the society, policies, religion? I think that that's a consideration to it's not possible to say with one word this is trending Korean studies through this piece of reasoning. Yeah. What about Sexan? Yeah, in case of Thailand, there are two kinds of academic events. Um, first is capacity building workshops. I think these are very famous and popular for um, scholars here, like coaching the coach, train the trainers, like scholars train uh, teachers in secondary schools, these kind of events. Second, I think it's more about international conference on Korean studies that engage every issues on Korean studies. This is a platform, it's more about platform for master students to present their papers because this is compulsory for their graduation. So I think this is matches with also our educational system as well. That is a kind of like condition for graduation. Um, in the case of research, the KSEP project I presented in my third uh, PPT is a new initiative that we try to expand the boundary by engaging um, different scholars in different fields to see more in Korea, to teach more, find any like topics, other topics in Korean studies rather than the K-pop, K-wave, Hallu issues. So I think this is a new wave that we just tried this year. So yeah, the result is still yeah, remain to see. Yeah, I, I also fully agree with uh, all, all of the panels. Uh, Dr. Young, anything to add? No, not really. Uh, but if I if I may, um, I mean, I I would like to uh, make a comment on uh, Dr. Saxon's point in his presentation uh, that uh, what um, um, Korean studies is. Uh, but before that, I fully uh, support his um, um, uh, proposal that uh, think globally and act um, locally, and I fully uh, support to this uh, proposal and um, and the situation is um, what uh, distinctive and different in uh, uh, locally so um, the uh, teaching methodology and um, research trends and topics and can be uh, varied uh, depending on different uh, uh, locations so I fully agree with that and but also um, uh, he uh, um, mentions uh, North Korean studies in Korean studies. Uh, I I also fully agree with this point, and um, North Korea should be incorporated um, in Korean studies as well. And um, but um, when we talk about Korean studies, um, this tension between uh, uh, Korean studies as an area studies versus uh, discipline uh, like um, uh, international relations or politics. Uh, 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 scholars working in those areas are they really Korean studies scholars or not? For instance, there are hundreds and hundreds of um, journalists and um, uh, North Korea uh, North American scholars who uh, comment on North Korea and write articles on uh, North Korea, but they do not. They cannot read a uh, Korean uh, language and Korean. They do not use uh, Korean. Uh, sources uh, for their report and um, uh, articles and research papers. Uh, so in that respect, I would like to, um, I mean, very cautious uh, to call them uh, Korean studies scholars. So they are not Korean scholars, but they are journalistic um, kind of um, a uh, analysts um, uh, uh, working on North Korea based on uh, English language sources. So in that uh, terms, uh, we can sort of um, uh, uh, limit um, this uh, definition of Korean studies and discipline uh, um, analyst or specialist, if I, uh, uh, if I may. Thank you. 
Yeah, I think uh, the situation is quite similar, perhaps in Thailand and then other Asian uh, countries, like uh, Dr. Yeon just pointed out, because in the Philippines, when when we say Korean studies or Koreanist, uh, we also uh, tend to include practitioners as well, not just uh, the, the, the scholarly workers in the higher educational institution or even basic educational institutions, because uh, perhaps uh, the, the pool, the population is rather smaller than uh, the European countries or North American uh, universities. But uh, and so I fully agree with uh, Dr. Yan as well. And then um, I think uh, what Sexan mentioned, like mentoring and then uh, providing the platform for postgraduate students is equally important because they are uh, next generation. So who can really carry out uh, uh, the, whether uh, in the regional study field or as a, as a discipline, Korean studies. So um, I think it really depends on the context, right? Where we work and then uh, what kind of students and teaching um, faculty we're dealing with. So uh, this is really important uh, to, to hear from each other. Um, so I think we can uh, tap uh, the last two questions. So the second to the last question is uh, maybe Pam, uh, you can please show this uh, what, I, what I type here. So um, earlier, um, professors mentioned, um, and then uh, in, in your bio note, I also noticed uh, you are really holding various uh, different positions in different institutions. And I think uh, when it comes to the UK, uh, Australia, we can also consider Korean migration, right? Because you have first generation or second generation, even third or fourth generation. So um, is there any particular exchange or collaboration you make uh, between local and Korean or is international uh, scholars or research institution, including perhaps uh, Korean migrant um, community in the UK, Australia and Thailand? I mean, I, I don't know much about this uh, migrant community between uh, different um, continents, but certainly there are academic exchange and collaboration between uh, uh, local institution and the international community like um, uh, Europe and Australia, Oceania, and also even uh, Southeast Asia. And a a as Dr. Fraschini mentioned, uh, we have an a Korean Studies Scholars Association called AXE, Association of Korean Studies in Europe, and um, um, uh, Australia and uh, Oceanic uh, um, uh, academic communities have uh, a similar academic uh, association. And um, um, I mean, there are not um, quite uh, very active exchange, but um, we have um, a couple of uh, um, um, scholar exchanges uh, when we uh, have this um, kind of academic association and also worldwide Korean Studies Association uh, such as uh, International Society of Korean Studies or World Congress of Korean Studies hosted by Academy of Korean Studies in Korea then um, 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 global uh, scholars um, get together and um, have chance to get exchange their ideas and the uh, research interest. So that is what I uh, know of. Yeah, at a much smaller level, at a much smaller level, I think the Korea Foundation supports, I'm pretty sure in Europe and also in Australia, I'm not sure in other parts of the world as well, uh, guest lectures among scholars from the same area so they so that the local association gets funding so that members of the association can be invited to other university for guest lectures and then also at an even much smaller uh, level there are agreements or um, collaboration between like korean universities and local universities so that courses get co-taught by scholars from both universities. Yeah. 
I think in case of Thailand, there are two things. Uh, the first is about the uh, alumni relationship. Those who graduated from Ihua Women's University, uh, Seoul National University, come back as professor, and um, they contact, they still contact, keep contact with the their professors. So I think this kind of natural connections that we we made it as a kind of engagement. So those who graduated from at the university, we promote the relationship with the university. And at second point, I think is about uh, we see less um, engagements of migrant Korean professors here. I think really interesting because perhaps because of the immigration policy here in Thailand that they have to extend the visa and I think this kind of more complicated. So is there's another issue intervening in these two. Yeah, and also the university contract that one year, two years. Yeah. Right, related to uh, migrant community and Korean community. I mean, uh, what I like to um, uh, emphasize um, emphatically related to um, uh, Dr. Frastini points on next generation teacher and researcher uh, education. I think the most important thing in the future for Korean studies is bringing up and educating uh, uh, next generation local researchers, local uh, um, teachers and local scholars. Um, so uh, people like me or uh, Dr. Uh, pair is kind of um, uh, have been uh, playing a role as a bridge, but uh, our uh, time is gone. So local people, local scholars need to be brought up, uh, educated uh, to sort of enhance a future of Korean studies in uh, each country and locally. Otherwise, uh, Korean studies cannot survive. Yeah, I cannot agree anymore <laughs> what Dr. Yeon mentioned because I'm also a Korean citizen who teach in the Philippines, but I uh, the first time I started teaching in the Philippines, that was really my dream as well, to grow more local, homegrown Korean study scholars. So it should really be eventually Filipino scholars in the Philippines and Thai scholars in Thailand like like in uh, respective countries, right? So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yeon, for pointing out. So let's see the last uh, question. Maybe uh, this last question is to just sum up uh, your your points and then uh, what uh, you haven't added uh, in your presentation. So uh, let's see the, the last question I just typed in. Uh, if you can just uh, briefly uh, mention the prospect that you observe uh, in term, uh, sorry, prospects in uh, fostering and sustaining Korean studies in your respective countries uh, from now on. So we can just uh, share some future directions uh, each other. Well, as I just as I just said before, I think that uh, the two single most important things would be uh, making sure that there is continuity between high school and university, that students can start learning Korean in primary school and finish with an university degree. So making that pathway available is an important thing. And I think that the second most important thing is, as I said at the beginning of my uh, presentation, is that to make students able to reach higher level of proficiency because it's not possible here to teach 20 hours hours a week for 10 weeks consecutively like having 800 hours of classes like in korea but with what we have we need to make the most out of it and make sure to have material resources and opportunities to study abroad in korea to make our students able to be proficient in Korea. Because it is important, as Professor Yuan explained, it is important to grow local uh, people to be able to be the Korean study scholar of the future. But if they don't speak Korean, it's really hard. Yeah, Sixan. Yeah, I agree with Dr. Nicola. Um, perhaps it should be Korean studies for the locals by the locals. <laughs> we just make like some catchphrase that, okay, um, locals see 
Korean studies matter for their life, for the future. At the same time, Korean studies should be met by the locals at the same time. I think so. This is um, the way that we sustain because we make ownership by the locals. And also, I agree with all the the issues raised by Rosa and Nicola about the proficiency about um, your future career. I think it's about future as well, career path. It's about um, perhaps you should have like mentoring program. We should push for um, this idea to uh, Korean cultural centers in any ASEAN countries or AKS or Korea Foundation on this about like um, start learning Korean during elementary school and then graduate. Bachelor in Princeton, something like this. So I think this is about future. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Yang, lastly. Right. Um, I mean, slightly different thing, but one thing to be noted um, in relation to high school uh, teacher and high school training Korean language, and we don't have um, a high school uh, Korean language program uh, established yet in, in the UK and um, other uh, Western European countries, except for some uh, French uh, uh, cases. Uh, so uh, I think we need to establish and develop some um, high school uh, uh, Korean language teaching um, uh, courses, if possible. And so, uh, as pointed out earlier, the Association, European Association of Korean uh, Language Teachers, um, uh, Korean Language Education, uh, uh, is only uh, open to uh, university teachers. Uh, the reason is uh, uh, because we don't have um, 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 teachers working in uh, high school levels in the UK. So that's one uh, aspect to be developed in this country. But um, having said that, uh, the prospect and uh, uh, and uh, fostering of Korean studies in Europe and in, in the UK uh, uh, narrowly is bright and um, uh, um, quite um, 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 a very bright uh, future in terms of student numbers and also academic numbers growing and then uh, interest, uh, general uh, interest is um, uh, growing. So I, I think it is quite bright. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I think this uh, really sums up what we have discussed today. Can, yes. I, can I share, because I'm doing some research about that at the moment, and yes, if I can find the slide, yes. there's a problem finding the slide. Uh, I, can't, I can't find the slide, so I'll just say this off the top of my mind. Oh, here it is. Can, can you share this a moment? It, it, I didn't prepare this, but I think that Professor Yun yes, would no be problem. happy to see this. It's in Italian, unfortunately. I think you can share now. Yeah. Which screen are you seeing at the moment? You can click present. Yeah, but I, I, have, I have to, you know. And then slides oh. and then your your computer add the file from your computer but you can't you can't see the slide no no this is not is it here no uh, we can see the green screen anyway i'll just say numbers it's just about numbers i've been yes. doing some research at the moment and between Between 2018 and 2021, high school teaching Korean language in Thailand grew from 119 to 175. In Europe, in four years, grew from 73 to 142. So it, it's growing, high schools in, in Europe are growing teaching Korean all over Europe. Good to know that. Hmm. Almost, almost double in four years. Good. <clears throat> so it's Italian source, right? No, the slides were in Italian. It, no, it's, it's a in Italy, in Italy, there are no high school teaching careers. Mm, okay. 100, 100 and the, the numbers I told you are just 
uh, mostly is in France, Germany, uh, some in Belgium, I think, a few in the UK, if I remember right, but not in Italy. Mm, okay, so um, perhaps next time uh, we can also look at other sources and then maybe other figures. So we can understand uh, some more about the UK, Australia, Thailand, and but, of yes. course, other but countries. Not... High school teaching Koreans overall right. are, growing, are, are growing all over the world. Mm -hmm. it, it's yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, that's true. It, it's quite similar in the Philippines as well. So uh, it will be quite useful uh, in the future. Uh, we will also share some figures with uh, Dr. Nicola uh, about the Philippine situation as well. So thank you so much, uh, our panels. I think uh, we have a few questions, but uh, the first question was quite uh, answered by our panel. So I will just read the question, but it, I think it was already mentioned by uh, the panels because uh, we talked about what topics, especially uh, research agenda, you observe uh, in your respective countries. So you also mentioned how we can mentor and how we can really foster the the academic uh, interest in uh, doing studies as a regional studies and also discipline. And then I think uh, there's one more question. I think uh, perhaps Dr. Yan can uh, give some, uh, share some knowledge because one of our audience is very much interested in Jeju language studies. So if uh, as a Filipino student, how can they really study about Jeju language or linguistics? Right. Um, there have been disputes recently uh, whether uh, Jeju uh, is a dialect or a uh, separate language. Um, uh, there are a handful of uh, scholars who claim that uh, Jeju is not a, a dialect but a different language from Peninsular Korean. So they hypothesize some kind of Koreanic language and split into Peninsular Korean and Jeju uh, Korean. But this is not uh, accepted by many scholars yet. So this is uh, one of hypotheses so far. So, so far, it is uh, considered as a, a, a dialect of a Korean language. And one of the alien uh, dialect, uh, that means um, uh, Seoul speakers like me uh, have difficulty understanding uh, all the generation of uh, uh, Jeju speakers. But uh, as you probably know, uh, this dialectal difference has been uh, less and less uh, so uh, due to media and other uh, uh, um, uh, standard language education. So it's an interesting topic and uh, still lots of um, uh, disputable points to be resolved. And um, uh, inside Korea, probably Seoul National Korean Language and Literature Department is the Center for Research on Korean Dialectal Studies, including uh, Jeju language. And outside of Korea, uh, there are many, a couple of uh, scholars working in this field in University of Hawaii Linguistic Department. Um, the renowned name is Professor William O'Grady. Um, have published articles on this issue recently. So. Um, you can refer to these people uh, if you are interested. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Yan. Um, and I think um, uh, she can also contact uh, University of the Philippines Department of Linguistics because uh, Filipino linguists, my colleagues, are also uh, in close uh, relationship with uh, Dr. O'Grady. So if you are really into uh, Jeju dialect or language or linguistics uh, studies, uh, you can really uh, talk to our department as well. So thank you so much uh, for everyone today. And I think uh, personally, uh, I, I really have to say, Thank you so much uh, to each and every one of you and uh, hope uh, our audience will give a virtual round of applause uh, to all our panels once again. Um, before we just wrap up, I will, we will just show you uh, two posters. Currently, UPKRC is uh, running Korea Essay Contest for 2023. So if you're interested, uh, please check out our Facebook page. And also, we are calling for some papers for Hanpil. Hanpil is the journal of uh, UPKRC. So uh, feel free to visit our Facebook page or website. So... Um, with that, uh, we will wrap up this session and hopefully uh, we can keep in touch with uh, Dr. Yan 
Dr. Nicola and Sexan, so we can really forge uh, some sustainable uh, partnerships after this forum. 감사합니다. 잘 알아봐. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you.